Well, welcome, Jim, and also welcome, everyone. Um, it's so good to see this wonderful turnout and see everyone. Um, this is one of the early um, studio visit. We're doing a summer series this summer, and um, for June, we are visiting a couple different studios. Um, and this was spearheaded by a conversation with Penelope and Lyle. Um, and then, uh, so thank you so much, Penelope, for organizing this and bringing us to these amazing places. And um, we can turn it over to you. To me, okay. Yeah, if you wanna, if you would just wanna say. Should I say a few words about, I actually yeah. thought Lyle might do it. And then at the last minute, I realized that we haven't been in conversation, so I, I copied a bunch of things from oh, your, dear. from oh. your Zwerner <laughs> oh, bio. So I just gotta, like, you obviously need no introduction to any of us, but I'll just say a few things here. Um, that you have had solo and <laughs> group shows internationally. And um, in, to, in 1992, you were part of Documenta 9, and 2008, you were in the Whitney Biennial, or J Jim was in the Whitney Biennial. Um, Jim was a recipient of the Infinity Award, um, the ICP Infinity Award in 2014, has been published by Roman Numerals, Aperture, Pretzel, Steidel, Mac, um, and was the chair of the photography department at UCLA from 1995 to 2016. And um, since 2012, uh, has been a professor at Princeton. Um, so is there anything else that I should say here? Numerous awards and exhibitions had a survey at the show that traveled nationally and internationally. Oh, good. Well, that's enough. Okay. Thank you, right. Penelope. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, it's, um, at first I thought, I did a talk uh, a couple of weeks ago at Mass Art, and I was really looking forward to going up to Boston and uh, spending time there and seeing friends and then talking and visiting students. But in the end, you know, we did a, um, a Zoom talk, but I was able to talk from my dark room uh, or work room or whatever you want to call it because it's not really a dark room. Um, so I realized there are some advantages to um, this new environment we're in. Um, I can't see, see most of you, but um, I can, um, I can feel your vibes. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you know, I want to um, both get to what I'm doing now uh, very quickly, but I also want to just run through some of the stuff that uh, got me to where I am right now. Um, I'm going to minimize all of your faces. Um, so let's go to full screen view. And um, Oh, sorry about that. Um, and some disadvantages. Yeah. Um, so I I use PDFs, and uh, eventually they want to advance. So this is I think on a sixty second advance, I hope. But because I put it together from a couple of other PDFs, it, maybe it will some of the slides will advance, and I'll have to just go back if I'm talking about them. This is a picture I took of uh, John Baldessari's class in 1973 when I was a first year grad student. Uh, we went out on a walk and uh, took photographs, passed the camera around, and then I photographed um, John and the, um, the tall one and Dee Dee Basic on the left, Suzanne Kuffler, Matt Mulliken, and Dave Trout. Um, being John's student at CalArts was very important. Uh, John died in January, so I've been thinking a lot about John. I wrote a couple of pieces about John. And one of the things that he um, encouraged his students to think about making art, um, both not to take it too seriously, to think of it as a, um, as a game with certain rules, uh, and to experiment. And there was nothing that was uh, off limits. Turns out that John was a very accomplished photographer. He won prizes in high school for photography. So when I knew him, he was pretending like he didn't know how to use a camera. He was a total rube. Uh, so it was kind of interesting when I um, went back and read his catalog resume and saw that he was actually a very proficient photographer before he became an artist. Um, John, of course, 
you know, worked with photography, expanded its um, possibilities. Uh, when I was a student at CalArts, I was very interested in uh, images from magazines. On the top are Winston and um, Marlboro ads that I was collecting. Um, um, I'm pinning stuff up on my studio wall. So my thesis show for, at CalArts consisted of uh, um, juxtapositions of images. Well, here's a, a view of my studio floor with some cigarette ads and some other photographs and um, scissors box of um, Agfa Brovira uh, paper on the right, even though I really wasn't doing much of my own printing. Um, so I made a couple of, um, maybe you could call them ironic, um, photographs of different famous artists. This is, uh, Mark, of course, Mark Rothko and Alberto Giacometti, both smoking. Um, this was in my thesis show. And then this picture, um, Jackson Pollock and Richard Serra. Uh, recently, I tried to get the rights to the Pollock picture. Uh, the Serra picture, I already was able to get the rights to as for a um, print for CalArts to kind of benefit uh, the 50th anniversary of the founding of CalArts, but we just could not get the rights to the Pollock. Um, so it exists as a collage, but it, I guess it won't be, uh, nothing else will, get, will happen with it. A little upsetting to that the uh, art that the uh, Krasner Pollock estate wouldn't give me rights to use this to benefit CalArts. Um, when I was 25, uh, I graduated from CalArts the year before. I was really at a loss as to what to do. I didn't want to just cut pictures out of magazines. Um, so I borrowed a friend's darkroom and made some photograms of my hands. Um, a couple of months later, I used those photograms to make these pictures, uh, positive photograms. And without really thinking too much about it, I, I saw that I could use these resin coated black and white prints as paper negatives. And so I inverted these uh, pictures. And it turned out that I, I have subsequently done other photograms and I really like flipping them around so they're positives. Um, as I said, I made these when I was 25. I then really committed to photography. Uh, I wasn't sure when I graduated from CalArts what kind of work I would do, video, performance, installation, uh, photo pieces, but I decided I really wanted to be a photographer. So I bought a four by five camera, taught myself how to process film and went around mostly at night in Santa Monica, California, where I was living and photographed uh, at night, but also by day, um, biking around with a four by five on the back of my bicycle. Um, I learned that uh, you had a choice. You had a choice in uh, when you printed black and white. You could choose different sorts of papers. So I chose a very bluish photographic paper, and this um, these prints actually they're four by five inches, made on a no longer manufactured paper called Azo, which was very slow and very blue. This is one of my friends, Jack Goldstein, who was a student at CalArts and who I was very close to. So this project uh, includes portraits and photographs of architecture. So I called it Los Angeles Architecture and Portraits. The filmmaker, Erica Beckman. I was just uh, really struggling uh, with photography, making contact prints it was saved my negatives, which were sometimes so dense that you could look at an eclipse through them. I was terrible technically, uh, but somehow or other, I was able to make prints of these negatives. So I'm not doing a chronological talk. I'm starting out with some early work, but then uh, 20 years after I made that picture of the Exbrook Arms in Santa Monica, I began a project really without really understanding what I was doing. I began to photograph light bulbs. This is in 1995, uh, 1994. Um, I was traveling, showing in Europe. So this is a picture I took in a friend's apartment in France. 
Uh, this is an elevator in Belgium. So I began to make photographs of light. I called them light sources. Um, I'm having a running argument with my uh, friend and colleague down at Princeton, Jeff Whetstone. Uh, whenever I see a picture with the sun in it, I think that's a, I say that's a great photograph. And Jeff says that's a, a total no-no. You never want to do that. Well, I guess I'm on the no-no side here. Um, So these pictures uh, begun in, uh, when I lived in New York in 1995, I went out to Los Angeles to work uh, to take over the photo program that Robert Heineken had started. And um, these are my first actual, this is my first digital prints. I used film, but I scanned the film and made what were then known as iris prints. I also mined my photo, um, archive. This is a picture of Jack Goldstein, same period as the earlier LA architecture. So I incorporated some of the pictures that I'd made in LA in this series light sources. And I also used some of my appropriated images from that period also. Wolfgang Tillmans. Um, I was uh, both inspired by and mutual admiration uh, for each other and uh, at one point, Tillman's was asked by a magazine if they could photograph him. He said, uh, yes, but only if Jim Welling does it. Wolfgang didn't know about my portrait work, so he thought I would never consent to take a portrait, but um, I did. So this is Wolfgang. Different sized prints, mostly big, but uh, this is a small one. Um, so with light sources, um, again, I photographed almost anything I could think of because it turns out it's a truism that every, every thing we see with our eyes is because of emitted or trans transmitted or reflected light. So everything is a light source. Um, and then arcing way back Right after the uh, LA architecture and portraits pictures, I uh, visited my parents in Connecticut. I grew up in uh, Northern Connecticut and I began to photograph there. So these are, it's a group of pictures of a 19th century book with landscape pictures. It was called Diary and Landscape. Uh, the diary was uh, written by my father's great grandmother in the 1840s. And I was really struck by the quality of the handwriting and the physical properties of the paper. Also, it was, uh, you know, 100 years. Uh, this was the around the dawn of photography, 1840. So I thought it was uh, a kind of appropriate to start your career. These are some of the first pictures after the LA architecture ones that I um, was referencing the early history of photography. And then other pictures, my mom's plants, a plant from 1840. Then I'll show a few other, I think this is the only other documentary project I'll show you. I photographed uh, right before light started, Light sources, I photographed uh, railroads, um, sort of a, uh, you know, all my early work was in black and white. Color wasn't an option, but I found that uh, these railroad landscapes were um, uh, just fantastic in black and white. Is everyone still there, Penelope? Yes, yep, we're all here. Okay. Just, <laughs> I, I assume yeah. we're all here. Yeah, well, usually, you know, there's, yeah. a, there's, there's some rustling. I'm on mute so that you don't hear me 
clicking away if I because oh, oh, I'm yeah. taking a few notes. So oh no problem, no problem. Good. Okay. So um this picture, which is pretty obscure, this is actually a silver factory um, in uh, central Connecticut. And, um, you know, I began to think a little bit more about what photography was, silver and gelatin. And so this is a very obscure picture of a silver factory and also some train tracks on the left. I, as I get older, I think more about these elemental components of photography the silver part, the gelatin part. But here I was just interested in the, the sort of both evocative and uh, haunting kind of subject matter around railroads, but also it's also a very mundane way to get around uh, the subway. I go to Princeton by train. I also photographed uh, houses. These are in West Virginia. I was really struck by the, uh, these wood frame houses which I quite love. Of course, you know, you can't photograph, make a picture like this without referencing Walker Evans, who uh, of course was a great early influence of mine as was Maholi Naj, Paul Strand, Barbara Morgan. Charles Birchfield, Edward Hopper, all of that Americana uh, I was steeped in when I was in high school. And so uh, uh, 15 years out of high school, I was able to go back to uh, the subject matter that really interested, interested me when I was an adolescent, which was a kind of brooding American uh, uh, vernacular architecture. And uh, this picture, when I show it, uh, I've shown it a couple of times in um, uh, survey shows, I always like to have this picture next to this picture. So this is uh, a picture from 1995, 94, a bridge in Cumberland, Maryland. And then this is a, a photogram made in 1998. Uh, I was still making railroads, but I began this sort of way that I work now, which is working on an abstract project, but also on more documentary things. So this is, uh, these are small strips of paper that I laid down on uh, eight by 10 film and um, made photograms and then inverted them, scanned them and then flipped them around in the computer and then made digital negatives and printed them as darkroom prints. So it's a kind of mix of digital and analog. with architectural associations. Uh, I also was thinking of, you know, certain avant-garde scores uh, where music, where you have bars, John Cage or um, Earl Brown, would just have lines. Thought of them in terms of music. And then a very early project, I photographed aluminum foil following the um, LA architecture. And I was printing on that same strange blue paper, Azo. These are very small prints, two by three inches or four by five. One of the things that I discovered with this group of work, which I made 15 years after the aluminum foil pictures, and I think it's true of abstract art in general and abstract photography is that you enter this sort of headspace when you look at an abstract work. And I've always felt with these, uh, I call them new abstractions, I could enter them for a few seconds and then the space was so uh, cold or uh, uh, hard to get into that I would have to jump out. And with the aluminum foil pictures too, it was a, you could get lost in these folds, like looking at a field of, wheat or something, uh, a tree, and then you exit. And, um, you know, that's not true of all photographs. Many photographs you can enter and, uh, and never leave. But with the, these abstract pictures, they're, they're uh, I don't know if forbidding is the right word, but you don't want to stay on them too long, but you also are attracted by them. This is an installation view at uh, the uh, first Metro picture space where I showed them. 
this is my studio setup. I had a single light bulb and you can see the aluminum foil on the right. Um, following the aluminum foil, I made these pictures with a piece of actually orange velvet, uh, drapery velvet and uh, pastry dough. For about five years, I worked in restaurants to support myself and the aluminum foil came from the restaurant and this pastry dough also uh, I used to make um, like shepherd's pie. I always thought that there was a relationship between photography and cooking. You know, you wear an apron, you've got these different procedures, lots of water. And then this project, which I did uh, in 1984, where I photographed um, chunks of gelatin, I was really struck by the component uh, that phot photographs are made of gelatin and silver. I showed you that silver factory, and this was my sort of bookend to what photography was. It was gelatin, which is, as we all know, um, animal and vegetable material that's been boiled down. And it's a very interesting material property uh, that I'll get to in a little bit later with some other work, also made with gelatin. Um, then jumping ahead, uh, to the last group of abstract pictures I'll show you. These are some recent chemograms where uh, I've painted with fixer or developer and then developed and fixed um, pieces of paper. So I'm using the materials out of sequence. The white forms were fixer, and then of course the black is uh, developer. These are all done in room light. And I started these about 2013. And it really got me thinking about how to work in photography, but not have a dark room. So these are done in room light and you'll see some of the other processes that I'm working on. I don't have to turn the lights off. These are pretty small, most of them, eight by 10 or 11 by 14. Although I have made bigger ones. The small ones seem to have an energy that it's hard to reproduce uh, larger. This um, picture I used um, olive oil, put olive oil all over the paper and then uh, poured developer on the paper. And um, I don't know if any of you have made chemograms where you paint with photochemistry on black and white or chromogenic paper. Uh, Mariah Robertson makes chemograms. A lot of people, um, if you go online, there's lots of lots of ways to work with uh, chemograms. Scratching, drawing. So the work I've been doing for the last 15 or so years has really been um, largely focused on color. And, um, I'll, you know, I'll, ever since I've been interested in photography, I've thought about color. I made Polaroid pictures when I was uh, just starting out. Um, I didn't make a lot of C prints until I got to UCLA. And then at UCLA, I installed a chromogenic printer, RA4 processor. And so the UCLA curriculum was uh, chromogenic printing. I, I put black and white on the back burner because a lot of the students at UCLA were not art majors, uh, were not photo majors, they were painters or sculptors. And so they just wanted to make, make some photographs or do photo pieces. So coming out of my working with Baldessari, I didn't think it was necessary to you know, teach students to, how to make black, you know, small black and white prints and then graduate to color. Right away, we went to color. So I was thinking a lot about color. Um, about 10 years into the 20 years I was in Los Angeles, I tried to think about how to deal with the fact that color, we see it with red, green, and blue receptors. You have red, green, and blue layers of dyes, cyan, magenta, yellow dyes, red, green, and blue sensitivity. 
trichromatic vision or trichromatic processes. Turns out that all color is mediated by trichromatic uh, processes, except one, which is too complicated and too impractical, the Lippmann process, which is a direct color process, which doesn't use trichromatic um, methods. Um, so everything is done trichromatically, the brain, the eye, the camera, reproduction, all red, green, and blue, or cyan, magenta, yellow. So in this picture, which is called a hexachrome, I set up my four by five in front of this succulent. Uh, it was a windy day, so the shadows were moving all over the, the shadows of the trees outside the frame were moving all over these succulents. And over the course of about five minutes, I exposed, I made six exposures on the film, red, green, and blue filters, then cyan, magenta, and yellow filters. So wherever the sun uh, was hitting the succulent at that moment, it would record that filtration. So you, as the shadows whipped around, uh, you can see that um, different filters are being revealed, red filter, blue filter, yellow, magenta, cyan. So I, um, and I work, I don't know if intuitively is the right word, but I had this group of filters that I was uh, experimenting with. And I was invited by New York Magazine to photograph the Philip Johnson Glass House in 2006. It was opening up to the public. Uh, it was a national trust for historic preservation site. And so I took my uh, filters and went there with a early digital camera uh, and put my filters in front of the lens and began to photograph the glass house using uh, colored filters. Um, actually, as, as soon as I say that, this is the only picture, one of the few pictures that doesn't involve a pure filtration. I put the took the bottom of the picture and turned it into a grayscale image in Photoshop. But in general, these pictures are all made with uh, frosted plexiglass, uh, clear acetate filters, very little Photoshop manipulation. I crumpled up uh, a piece of mylar and put it in front of the lens. Um, I had a, something called a diffraction grating, which breaks light up into a spectrum. I rotated the filters as I took a one second exposure. So this, um, I went to the glass house uh, 12 times, I made videos, I took a lot of photographs and it became a laboratory for experimenting with both color filtration and then how to print these. So these were my first inkjet prints. I, uh, to print them, I bought an Epson printer and that really changed uh, my life. I think that uh, inkjet printing, as opposed to say C printing, Inkjet is a totally different medium. It's, the ink is thick, it doesn't have the transparency, it still has some brightness to it, but it's just, a, to me, it seems like a very different medium. Ink versus dyes. Pigments versus dyes. So I learned a lot about uh, inkjet printing uh, in the glass house, a project I worked on for uh, four years. Then I had the opportunity to print a book at uh, Meridian Printing in Rhode Island. And uh, I went there and spent two days at Meridian um, watching the book being printed, but I also wandered around the factory and photographed this uh, project, which I call Meridi Meridian Printing. I um, took the files uh, after I came back home and uh, altered them by intensifying the red, yellow, blue primaries uh, in hue and saturation, and then uh, desaturated all the grays, and then futzed around with them. So there's uh, a lot of desaturation and resaturation. 
And this was um, printed as a small book by um, Roman numerals by Meridian. They were very happy to print this. Um, my father worked for a printing company, so I've always been interested in mechanical reproduction. And uh, this being at Meridian, thinking about the process of four color offset, thinking about trichromatic color has pushed me into this whole new um, project, experimental or endeavor, right? Th thinking about how images are, are put together. So this is an example of a sheet at the top of this um, pile of printed material. This is called a, um, uh, a make ready. It's a piece of paper that's run through the printing press n multiple times to get the press up to speed. So every time a new signature is put on the press, uh, you need to run 50 or 100 sheets of paper through the press to get the, even, the ink even. And then the thrifty printer will save that sheet and they'll uh, run, use them a second time. So you get these very strange juxtapositions of images. And I became interested in make readies. So I began to create my own make readies, scanning different books, typography books, catalogs, flat material, and then stacking them up in red, green, and blue channels of Photoshop. So you get these strange juxtapositions and overlaps, overlays. I think the, it's interesting that the make ready, which is the name for this, my father called it usable scrap, but make ready is uh, what most people call, call these uh, objects, is an inversion of the ready-made. Uh, Duchamp's uh, famous uh, use of uh, uh, found objects. I discovered also in the glass house, and then as I began to work with these more bizarre uh, color combinations, that these colors, which seem very um, abnormal, you'll, I, I would see them in graphic design, I'd see them in signage, I'd see them in the world. So this is one of the earliest uh, uh, photographs from a body of work that I call multi-channel where I'm taking three photographs, this time a Tony Smith sculpture and two, two images of the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford and stacking them up in red, green, and blue channels and then uh, using hue and saturation, selective color, gradient maps to further alter the color. The Wadsworth invited me to do a project about um, their collection or their building um, because they were remodeling and reopening the whole museum in 2014. So this is an image that I made of uh, the Morgan Hall uh, taken in 1925 with two of my own uh, photographs. So it mixes an archival picture with two of my own uh, images. Um, I also did a project for the Museum of Modern Art Sculpture Garden and um, other, I photographed other uh, objects. One of the things that I um, decided I wanted to work on was dance. And I wanted to use these multi-channel techniques. So in 2014, I got together uh, some UCLA art students who were studying dance. And uh, for four Saturdays, I had them pose based on historic dance photographs. One of my most important um, early art school experiences was taking dance classes. And I was, for a year and a half, I was very interested in dance. And when I transferred to CalArts, I dropped dance because I needed to focus on making visual art, but I never lost my uh, 
love of or uh, interest in uh, modern dance. So these are pictures uh, that I asked my UCLA students to reenact. You can see the upper, upper left and the two pictures on the left are, um, let's see if I can go back. Uh, this, this one is one of them. Maybe they're both reenacting this picture. So I began to photograph uh, the UCLA students. I also worked with Barnard College and Manhattan Marymount students. And uh, I wasn't satisfied with just working with the, the dance pictures. So I began to um, incorporate architecture into the three channels. And it turned out that I was uh, in Florida visiting my mother-in-law and I photographed a, a remarkable building by Marcel Breuer. You can kind of see it on the left-hand side of this picture. And then, so this project uses generally one picture of a brutalist building by uh, uh, either Breuer or um, other architects with two dance pictures. So this is one of uh, my students uh, and then a very dim picture on the lower right. You can see it's kind of greenish to com compose the third channel. Here's another Marcel Breuer building with a uh, Renaissance dance by the New York City ballet dancer, uh, David Halberg. Terry O'Connor with some buildings in Hartford and some landscape. Uh, this is a picture I took uh, on the West Side Highway of uh, Barnard College and Manhattan Marymount uh, dance students. You can see on the left, um, that's me photographing. When I was able to work with an assistant with the students, I would, uh, both of us would, would photograph because it was, um, I was never sure I was getting the right um, angle. So I generally tried to have a grad student assistant. And so, uh, JR, my assistant that day, photographed me uh, photographing the same group of dancers at the same uh, instant. So you can see, I can see certain of the dancers are repeated. With the glass house, a lot of the pictures were straight. These are heavily worked on, lots of painting through layers. Uh, layers are dissolving. I began to work with a dance company in Los Angeles, LA Dance Project. So there are about half of the pictures are LA Dance Project. And then um, as I worked this way, I became interested in antecedents, precedents um, to this kind of psychedelic photography that I was um, creating. And on the left, this is a, a page, I didn't have time to grab the full picture, but this is just a layout from a catalog that is coming out of the choreographed pictures. On the left is a double page spread of a Richard Avedon um, ad campaign called Moondrops for Revlon. And I went to the Avedon studio to find out where I could uh, locate these. And they gave me a whole list of all of the issues of Vogue where Avedon's pictures appeared. So they, I don't know if you can see, but the, it's a color photograph with certain elements are replaced with very vibrant colors. As I looked at the Avedon, I also uh, remembered that there was a whole group of artists in the 1970s who worked with this, what I call multi-channel color where they weren't satisfied with what color negatives gave them. And they began to work on offset presses typically or with silk screen. So the next three pictures are from a small catalog called Four on the Offset Press, uh, published by the um, uh, Visual Studies Workshop in Rochester. So this is Joan Lyons. 
um, Sil Labrat, who worked with uh, Silk Screen and Dye Transfer, and Todd Walker. So what these artists are doing is, you know, working with the channels. Uh, I'm not saying this work is necessarily uh, the greatest work, but it was uh, a kind of uh, breath of fresh air from the Walker Evans School of uh, new topographics or new color or all of the kind of more mainstream straight ahead uh, photographic processes that proliferated in the 70s and 80s and 90s when uh, type C printing really came of age. Uh, these artists from the 70s, working up in Rochester primarily, uh, were really hampered by the fact that, A, there was no simple way to make these color photographs. You had to get an offset press or a silk screen. Um, um, although that's not exactly true, uh, in uh, my teaching at Princeton, I teach a class called uh, Pathological Color, and I was scrolling around on the internet, and I found this book from the 70s, maybe early 80s, that Kodak published, and it was a how-to guide to make these uh, multi-channel photographs using uh, a color processor, using black and white film, uh, sandwiching it, uh, multiple exposures, things like that. So it, it, there was a way to make uh, multi-channel color, but it was still very, very difficult before digital and inkjet printing. So uh, while I was working on choreograph, I was invited to um, take some photographs for the Chicago Architecture Biennial in 2017. And I photographed buildings by Mies van der Rohe in Chicago, but it turned out that I'd visited Chicago in 1986, uh, 1996, and 2006, and photographed the same building, buildings by me. This is Crown Hall. And so I combined those 20 years of negatives together to make this picture. This is um, the um, post office in Chicago more like the moon drops where I substituted certain colors. Uh, back to using recycling images from 20 years. The moon drops technique, which basically involves taking two color files, duplicating the same file and sticking uh, a gradient map in between them. And back to the dance, um, LA Dance Project. Um, what was really surprising was um, LA Dance Project and um, actually the dancers of LA Dance Project and the choreographers, Kelly and Gerard, who are, were New York based, now they're uh, living in France. They did a piece at the Glass House. So I was able to go back to the Glass House uh, a few years after I finished my project and photograph at the glass house a second time, but using these new uh, techniques that I uh, um, created. And then other choreograph photographs. Lucinda Childs, Available Light, Light Dance Project, a rehearsal. Kyle Abraham, another Kelly and Gerard kind of work. So I began um, to get tired of um, making all these appointments to photograph dance, getting uh, the dancers to sign releases. Um, so anyway, it was um, the choreograph project after about four years uh, came to a sort of graceful end. It's now pretty much completed and uh, a show in Rochester will uh, open uh, next month, I hope. 
uh, probably really in, realistically in September. But I wanted to keep working with uh, bodies. And so I began to go to museums uh, starting in 2000, um, really 16, when I was actually working on choreograph, I started photographing uh, Greek and Roman sculpture. And so the, this last group of photographs I'll show you is uh, up as a digital show uh, at Regan Projects. Of, um, so I'm gonna show you how I make these pictures. This is a, um, it's an oil on a laser print. But before I get there, I'll show you this. The day I went to the Met, I photographed that sculpture that I just showed you and I photographed this head. Uh, I photographed a lot of heads. I wanted to do uh, Roman portraits. And uh, I kept uh, scanning or, or printing and this head just kept speaking to me. Turns out this was a woman born in 170 AD, died in 230 AD. She was the mother of an emperor. She was effectively the Roman emperor for 10 years while her son uh, came of age. Her name is Julia Mamea. But her face is badly disfigured. Uh, half of it's been hammered away. Her nose, which is very common, has been smashed. That was a, a sign of, uh, you know, on disapproval or disrespect or, um, I mean, it didn't start with the Romans, it started uh, in other parts of the, the antique world. But this sculpture, those eyes uh, were very compelling. So I began to, um, this is the same sculpture, it's the same file. I zoomed in on the head, I flipped the head around and I created a, a new process Ever since I'd begun working on choreograph, I wanted to try to figure out a way to make a handmade color photograph. And my attempts were always failures. This process, which I developed, comes out of a 19th century printing process, basically photolithography, using gelatin and potassium dichromate. Instead of using oil paint or, or lithography ink, I used dye, so I created a, a digital negative. I and then uh, exposed it to the sensitized gelatin surface on a piece of plastic, washed away anything that wasn't hardened, and used dye to create uh, the image. All of these pictures you're going to see are uh, made from exactly the same negative. So these first three, uh, these. Uh, uh, are all made within a few days of each other. I was really struggling with the process uh, using different dyes, different inks. Um, not sure of what would work, but what was absolutely astonishing to me was that every time I printed the face, it she seemed to uh, address me in a different way. Her uh, gaze changed, her Hair has changed. Uh, she looked like a Roman woman occasionally, sometimes, or she would look like a, someone from the 1920s. Absolutely uh, um, surprising and uh, amazing to print the same negative over and over, and it would change. So Michael Mack is gonna do a book of these of about a hundred of them. I learned that um, all color photographs are made with dyes. I think we, everyone knows that, but what was really surprising was that these are fabric dyes and that there's a connection to the ancient art of fabric dyeing and photography still haven't quite figured out how to do anything with that, but I was really surprised. This is using India ink, which sticks to different parts of the gelatin matrix. And then I printed the negative, the actual way she's looking. And again, this face, changes from one of horrific violence to 
serene contemplation. Um, I began to think about what this meant, what this horrific face represented, and I discovered or finally realized that it represents religious intolerance. These sculptures were damaged by um, probably Christian uh, zealots who were interested in overturning the pagan world. Julia was uh, alive at a time when Christianity was rising in Rome. She was actually friends with a number of the Christian leaders, but her, she came from a family of priests from Syria. She was Syrian and her family uh, were sun god priests. She was born in Homs, Syria. Anyway, I uh, began to read more about antiquity and I realized I wanted to, besides just photograph busts, I wanted to think more about the ancient world and do something with it. After three months of making these pictures, uh, I realized that potassium dichromate is a carcinogen and I uh, didn't want to work this way anymore. So I began to research non-toxic ways to work with Im imagery and I came up with uh, another process. This is a, um, basically it's a uh, photolithograph um, using a Hewlett Packard laser printer. I image uh, a color image or a black and white image onto a piece of plastic and then use oil paint to color the image. Uh, the first ones I made were in black and white and what's striking about these pictures are, is that they're, they, the quality of the, the black is very beautiful. It's very matte, uh, almost oily at times. And you can see that the background, the white of the, the, the paper or the plastic is kind of creamy. So I started these um, almost a year ago. I went to Athens. I photographed a lot in Athens and in Eleusius. This is an acanthus plant in Athens. The Roman Agora, the marketplace in, in, uh, down the hill from the Acropolis. Part of the Acropolis, part of the Parthenon, sorry. This is a view from the Acropolis. So these are oil paint on laser print. And I'll, when I finish the talk, I'll demonstrate one. It's hard to see this picture has a lot of water uh, streaming down it and that I then captured. This is at the Met, it's a bronze crab. I was, became very interested in little figurines and uh, other sorts of objects. This is a pomegranate, a terracotta pomegranate. I also became interested in uh, Roman sculptures and in gesture. So uh, I have a group of pictures of hands Wreaths. These are all from probably uh, fifth to third century BC, the objects I've been showing you. This is a, a makeup container. At the site, uh, the archaeological site of Eleusius. Archaeological Museum in Athens. Athens. 
the Erechtheon, uh, head of a priest, fig leaves. And then finally, I'll show you some, uh, these are a uh, different process. They're not lithographs, they're UV prints, which is a new technology where you can print directly on any surface really. So these are printed directly on metal. And um, the Propylaea on the Acropolis. And I used an app to figure out what the stars would be um, uh, in the sky the, the day I created this photograph. So those are uh, accurate stars looking to the Southwest. This is an angel in uh, the Louvre. Uh, I mean, a Greek angel. Pre Christian. And finally, this photograph, which uh, I'll end with, it's a picture of Socrates, um, but it's my homage to John Baldessari because it reminds me uh, quite a bit of John. So. Um, That is my recorded talk. And let's see. Okay, have I left? I've left uh, screen share. And you can see me. So let me um, just turn this a little bit over here and I'll show you my darkroom sink. So this is, uh, hang on a second. I don't want to get oil paint on my shirt. <laughs> um, so I have a tray of water here. I have a laser print on a pronto plate. This is black and white. I'm gonna, any of you have made a, made a you know, photolithograph, you would know what this, these procedures are. So you soak the, the plate. I'm going to use blue and black oil paint. I use Windsor and Newton. I'm going to use Prussian blue and Mars black. it up. What I like about this process is I can create any you know color I want, any black. I can do a warm black, cool black. So over here, I have the, uh, the plate. And before I squeegee it, I'm going to remove some of the ink from the roller. And then I take my prayer. I roll it across the plate and I get a lot of um, imperfections. Like, but for our demonstration, I'm going to try to create a clean print.
and I'm going to wash it. And there we have it, a uh, oil on laser print image. Now, if I wanted to print this in color, I would just use my laser printer, print a color image, and then add, um, sometimes I'll subtract cyan, and I'll add cyan in uh, ink, or I'll print a very oversaturated image and roll it out with black ink. Anyway, it's a very interesting way. Wait, sorry, go on. Well, I was just wondering, so the, the ink, the, the printing ink sticks to the laser ink. Is that what that is, or was that actually yeah, it, etched? It, it turns out that um, laser prints use carbon particles, and they print with an 800-line screen. So any laser print has a halftone screen, and that's what permits the... Um, the uh, the oil paint to stick mm -hmm. to create a photographic image is the half tone. I'm just going to put this in the frame. Yeah. So the uh, the ink sticks to the carbon. It is repelled by the wet areas of the. I have these pre-cut mats so I can see the image a little bit better. Mm. And it's a bluish black photograph. Um, we're getting some stri stripes from the printer, which are unfortunate. I'll have to deal with that later. Okay, um, so that's that process. But I also wanted to show you uh, this picture, these Julia Mamea heads. So I made about 200 of these. So this is a, it's on a piece of plastic called Upo. On the back, you can see all the different colors. It's really a gum bichromate print using a halftone screen. It's completely um, matte at this point, but at one point it was you know, soaked in dyes and the dye stuck to different parts of the image. Um, anyway, um, but, but I love the back, the back of them because you can see these, uh, all of the, uh, you know, it's like you work in a, the idea of making a color photograph where you have trays of color is quite, uh, exciting. Mm. Um, don't try this at home. Okay, so that's my little nice. demo part. Wow, it's great. I, yeah. I, can I, I, I uh, say something that um, one of the most, I guess one of my first uh, kind of realizations around photography or sort of realization um, of something cool about photography was through reading a piece by Michael Ben, uh, Walter Ben Michaels about your aluminum work where he, oh, yeah. he talks about the, and also the handwriting. He talks about the difference between, um, or the tension between the surface of the photograph and the photographed surface. And um, I, I think there's a really interesting through line between that work that's so early and this work now, where in fact, in looking through some of the slides that you're showing us, there's this really great tension between some of the surfaces that are um, attention between the surfaces and the photographic surface that you're presenting to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that was a, um, I was very excited to meet someone who um, was able to talk about the, that sort of tension between what you're, what is being photographed and the way it's being presented. Mm. Um, so the idea of the photographic surface is obviously something that's, that's very important, but as a young photographer, I didn't um, 
I just bought different, I would buy different surfaces. You buy different photo paper, you buy different things. So as I've gotten older, I've tried to think about actually creating my own photographic surface. And it turns out it's really hard. Uh, so the, uh, these two new processes I'm working on, it's, an, it's sort of a, just an attempt to have some control over the surface. UV printing also, which is, uh, you can print on any material. It's very exciting. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah. photo surface. Yeah, really interesting. It's really great. Um, anybody else have, because I have like 10 questions. <laughs> I, I would like to ask, um, like, I saw like your interest in different like objects and researching like mundane objects, also both lights, light sor uh, sources. And I'm wondering like if the color for you, it's only related with the photography object or also the object, the color of the objects are uh, an interesting part for your practice or for your work. Um, yeah, yes, definitely. Um, I don't wanna only impose my own color onto things. I mean, I've been doing that for a while. Um, but with these laser prints, I'm, I'm both working very psychedelic uh, imagery, but I'm also doing more naturalistic uh, color. Uh, I, I, I don't know if I, if I can... Over here, I've got some uh, uh, pictures from Parthenon and different museums uh, where I'm really, uh, they're, they're very naturalistic. I don't know if that, that helps with your question. I can see that you, you like bright colors. And, uh, you've got some filters over your window. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, are you, where are you located? I am in, in, in Manhattan. Oh, you're in Manhattan, yeah. yeah. I, thought, I thought I recognized Manhattan out those windows. <laughs> no, I just like put them this morning to lock some light. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very rose colored there. Um, are these are these prints? They're all unique, right? Then, or you don't then make a negative like a another photograph that you can then addition, right? I do make them in additions, quote unquote. But the, the black and white ones are easier to um, make, repeat them. But um, the color ones, uh, uh, each one will be different. Mm -hmm. But they're not unique in in that I'm printing from the same matrix, but. Okay. When I roll the ink on, it's going to be different. Can I ask you a question that's not related to this body of work, but that's yes. related to the glass house? And yes. it's actually more of a question for the students to hear your answer to. Um, because I, I found it really fascinating that that began as an assignment, basically, or a commission. And, mm -hmm. and then it lasted for four years. So obviously it went past the assignment period. Yes. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about how assignments actually feed into maybe expanding work or, you know, giving opportunities for producing or creating or making or whatever um, that feed into your work and, and actually expand it somehow or, yeah. I, um, I have not done a lot of commercial work. Um, I'm, I have a lot of respect for people who can, who can uh, you know, produce pictures on the spot. It's always very, uh, it always anxiety producing to have to have to do something um, with a photo editor looking over your shoulder. But with the glass house, I was, um, I'd actually been turned down by um, an architecture magazine. I remember I, I proposed that I photograph the glass house using uh, filters. And they said, no way. So then I wrote to uh, New York Magazine and said I was just rejected by, I forget which magazine, uh, maybe you'd like to let me photograph the glass house this way. And fortunately, the editor, Jody Kwan, was very sympathetic to a different approach. And um, so I was able to do that. But I think I've done, I've, I've done two projects for the New York Times. I used to work for Los Angeles Magazine a long time ago. I did like three photographs. My assignment work is very, very limited. Mm. But one of the great things about working on assignment 
is that the magazine gets you all of the permissions you need. So it is a wonderful uh, way to just enter a situation without having to have written all these letters and you know gone, jump through all these hoops. So I would encourage you whenever possible to consider magazine work uh, or editorial as a great opportunity to get access to places that you might not be able to otherwise uh, get access to. And, um, right. but I, I just, uh, I, I, uh, when I worked in, I worked for Sotheby's and I also worked uh, as a photo assistant and uh, I was not good at either. So I, I have a lot yeah, actually, of I'm surprised. I, I actually thought, by the way, you introduced that project that that um, the magazine had approached you, knowing your style, to do this project. Well, uh, I think uh, the other way no, around. Yeah, yeah. But um, I let them know right away that I didn't, and they, that uh, coincided with what they wanted to do too. Yeah, yeah. So I was lucky. I, I have a question for commercial work. I just, I just don't. Yes. Oh yeah. Um, I was. Um, I really enjoyed um, you talking about uh, Meridian Printing in Rhode Island and that process of finding um, a printer. And um, I wanted. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, more about why you chose them and that process for you and um, any advice that you have for students who are thinking about um, printing their work in a book form, but also for students who, who are really, um, the, when, when the printing process or the alternative process of making the photograph is important in their work, how, how to guide them into like printing a book of that in a sense. Right. Um, well, I worked with the, uh, this, I mean, I, Meridian is a very expensive printer. I would not recommend that you even think about using them. Uh, I use their Indigo Press. Uh, the thing about printing books is that everyone has the same technology and there's no um, mystery about how good printing takes place. It's that the people who are running the presses are careful and that you give them the right files. So. I've had very good luck doing blurb uh, books for myself. Um, and I think I'm sure all of you have done um, on demand books. Um, there's nothing, uh, there's no mystery to it. You just have to have good files and a printer who is uh, paying attention. I've also had books that were horribly printed. I've had two books that were just, uh, I, I wanted to throw them in the river. Um, on different occasions. So you, if you get things printed, you will have disappointments as well, as well as successes. So uh, just be prepared. Um, I had a student in LA who did wonderful things on a laser printer. He had optimized his laser printer and he would print on newsprint and made beautiful little books. So you can, you can make great stuff with a laser printer too. Just have to understand what each technology is good for. I have another question on the subject of books also. Um, I saw your, your Julia show at Zorner, I think it was like last, must have been January. Yes. Um, I'm a huge fan of Mac and what Michael Mac does with all of his books. Um, and I was curious how you translated such a huge show into a book and, or, and how do books really function for you after having an exhibition of the work first? Well, um, that show, I, I think I exhibited 20 of the Julia heads. I was very unhappy with it. it um, I've subsequently shown them more bunched together, so they're in a grid. So you can see all of the different expressions. So the show was a disappointment. I mean, I love the work, but I don't think it was displayed uh, as well as it could have been. The book, I think, is going to be um, the most appropriate form for this this work because there's something called facing pages, you know, where you have, you know, the whole yeah. idea of the book, the portrait format, everything about that is about, you know, the face. So I'm excited about doing that. 
Um, Michael has, because of COVID-19, we put it on hold. I don't know if it's going to happen. Um, it turns out that these, these, these prints are very hard to color correct. You scan them, the scanner wants to do all kinds of, you know, the software wants to make them more vibrant. So I've had to go through a number of steps to kind of tone them down. And still, you know, I sent match prints that I made on my Epson printer and then files to Michael Mack. I don't know if we're gonna be able to make, to reproduce the work exactly as it is. I'm actually okay with it, them being a little bit different, right. uh, just as long as they look, um, they look okay. I mean, I think with printing, there's always a, it's never gonna be exactly the same as your photograph. Sometimes it's gonna be a lot better. Um, so it's, you know, I'm, I'm very hopeful that Michael will be able to get back, uh, get this back on the schedule and we'll get it printed. It'll be printed somewhere. I'm not going to go on press. I find going on press very nerve wracking because you go there and they say, do you like it when it comes off the printing press? And they say, but it's going to dry darker. Uh, just imagine it's going to dry darker. Do you like it? Uh, it's, it's extremely stressful. So, um, just one other thing on that is um, considering how much repetition there is in the actual subject matter itself. Do you have much of a hand in how you would sequence it, or I mean, is it like something like you know you do them chronologically because that's how you actually made them, or I um, I made an edit, then my wife took the material, she made an edit, uh, we fought over it. Uh, uh, <laughs> then I decided the easiest way to do it is just numerically, the first picture to the last picture. Um, but of course, there are a couple of ju juxtapositions that just didn't work. Um, so I had to change that a little bit. Uh, but if I, if I decided to edit the book, not numerically, it just would have gone on forever because there are all of these pictures that could look good next to each other. So I decided to do it. Uh, sequentially. I don't do that with all my books. So good question. Thank you. Thank you. It's interesting that, you know, when you, when you, you showed us the, the demo with that laser print and there were those lines in it and you said you had to fix that. And also this idea of bringing the work through this other process, which is the printing, the offset printing or whatever that, um, I'm curious about that as being yet another kind of, um, you know, mediating device that that you could really work with and play through. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, that you're not you're 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 okay with a bit of a change, but you still want the images to look. But yeah, it's something I think a lot about with presses. Like, yeah, they're supposed to be exactly right and really um, technically. Um, exact, but what happens when they're not? And yeah. Well, I would use. I'm going to have to use toothpaste uh, and a Q-tip on this uh, on the the marks that the printer left, or I'll just reprint it. Um, yeah. With all kinds of correction, you know, tools. But the whole idea of the medium, quote unquote, you know, photography is a medium. Um, one of the things that I like to tell students and, and think about is that every artist creates their own medium. And in photography, it's maybe easier to understand that, of course, you want to be in control of all of the different aspects of, you know, aperture, shutter speed, um, file management, printing. But then, you know, my understanding of Photoshop is very primitive. Uh, and I am not a, a whiz. And in fact, it, you don't, you look at historically photographers and it's shocking how little some of them know, but they're able to make that work for them. So it's important to try to get as much knowledge as you can, the things that you don't want, and you just concentrate on maybe a more primitive or simple um, uh, way of working. 
the, there's something interesting about this, uh, the idea of fidelity and reproduction, even with the content that you're working with, which is this head that you're reproducing multiple times. And in fact, the original sculpture that you photographed, I would imagine was also a reproduction. Um, interesting, yes, uh, it, it turns out that the um, imperial sculptures were created en masse, and I've seen uh, some other really bad sculptures of Julia Mamea. So she was a, a public figure, mm -hmm. and there was no mechanical reproduction. This was a kind of mechanical reproduction. Right, right. So her head, there are, there are apparently 20 versions of her head. I've seen two, and they're just awful. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and uh, plus many of the sculptures that I showed you, the Roman sculptures are reproductions, and they okay, used very, right. very s primitive three D imaging to create them using uh, a system of pins that would they drill into the stone uh, certain distances and then carve away. Um, it was a, almost a mechanized way of making sculpture. So, you know, we think we're, we've invented, you know, a kind of mechanical reproduction, but these Roman sculptures were often mass produced. Well, and they were copies of early, earlier Greek sculptures, right? Correct, correct. Yeah. But they so were all, right. as it were, scanned right, right. Um, with this, this, uh, these point systems. Right, interesting. I also um, love the idea that all of these sculptures were actually painted in these strangely dark colors. <laughs> and we have learned through history to understand them as being kind of blank white, you know, sort of blank slates for our ideas of beauty. And thinking about them with these kind of psychedelic colors on them just doesn't go with how we think about them. But what you're doing is actually in dialogue with that idea of the color, I think. Oh, absolutely. But I'm not, I'm not trying to reproduce the original colors, but I am like soaking them, dipping them in, into my own uh, mm -hmm. dye bath, as it were. Yeah. I want to, is this an um, MFA class? Yeah, this is, okay. yeah. these are all MFAs. Um, any other questions? I mean, I think it's, <laughs> this has been really great fantastic um demonstration and um, i can also send you a pdf of both of the processes that i use i i don't recommend the gelatin process but i can if any of you are does anyone work with gum bichromate <laughs> no <laughs> that's that's the process essentially but um the laser process i find very uh very easy to to use and it's uh it's limited in size, 12 by 18 is as big as you can go, but. Um, it's interesting, um, James, Jim, <laughs> I saw your name too, um, that it answered a, a riddle that I've been working, like, for years I've been making these drawings, these, these Xeroxes, laser, laser copies, and then putting graphite on them. <laughs> and not figuring, I, I didn't know what the, what the process was that made it work for me, but you just answered it that there's the laser whatever that the, the carbon in the laser is letting the oil of the graphite stick to it yeah yeah so yeah um yeah it would be great to see to have that if, yep. yeah the pdf <laughs> cool um i guess we should say thank you and and this is, <laughs> is <laughs> okay so thank you jim <laughs> Okay, well, thank you for inviting me, and it's uh, great to see you all uh, remotely. I've taken screenshots of both of the, looks like there are two screens of you, so uh, I appreciate showing up today, and... Uh, oh, may, may, may I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Yep, um, my question is, um, I, I'm curious about, do you have an idea first, then do the process, uh, like photograph or anything else, or you just do it, then you uh, start to, then you start to think about the meaning of it. For these pictures, I spent about two years 
researching and um, experimenting with this process before I had the image. Mm -hmm. So I was ready when I got the, the image. So the process came first and then I found an appropriate image. And I, I don't know if that's the way all my work proceeds, but I think, you know, just working in process, trying different things, uh, eventually and hopefully you, you find the right subject matter for it. So I think that's, um, uh, especially if, uh, you know, like certain work looks better in black and white. So you take a lot of black and white pictures, but then you find one, one, one subject that is very powerful in black and white. So yeah. it's similar to that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to have okay. lunch now. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for coming. It's good to see you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for holding this.